Good morning. Hi, folks. Hi. Hello. All right, first things first, I'm going to remove this bot from the meeting again. <laughs> you don't like the bot anymore? <laughs> Uh, it's not apparently, I found out it's not a Hyperledger initiative. It just, wow. um, this bot started to join all the meetings. Um, and apparently they even mailed them to like stop joining us, the, the Hyperledger meetings, but they didn't stop or react. And, uh, but the, 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 the opt-out message works. So that's good. I'm going to do that now. Oh, wow. So is it some bot just scraping public Zoom calls and joining them? I, I, that's my understanding, yeah. Wow. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> All right. Well, me and get my get my windows ready and we can start. Okay, <clears throat> let me share my screen and let's get into it. Okay, guys, so welcome once again on um, uh, Aries V6 community call. It's Third, uh, it's it's the second of March, two thousand twenty-three, and this is our Hyperledger antitrust policy notice, which you can take a a look at for a while. And we shall begin. So we have a rich agenda again, um, kind of. Lots of things uh, I was able to fit in here. Again, reminder for anyone, um, you can always feel free to add items here at your will throughout the week, before the week, before the meeting, or even just just tight before the meeting if, if something comes to your mind. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is what I came up with. Uh, so let's start with a recent um, a recent work uh, which has been done. Uh, so we first of all, we had a, a minor, uh, smaller serialization fix um, where this is uh, mostly uh, relevant. This is relevant for um, uh, like out of band producer uh, side or a role. So uh, in a role where Aries VCX was creating out of band, um, out of band messages. So that would be typically some issuer or verifier. Um, and uh, basically we were previously, if there was no attachments um, included attached to the out of band message, we would still previously create serialize a request attach field in a message and that will be empty array but apparently according to rfcs uh it's either this field is not defined at all or it has at least one message so that's what we do here 
basically the changes when we now create out of band out of band uh, message and we serialize it if the attachment field is empty uh, we we skip the serialization and um, yeah and here and the test over here we are also checking uh, that we are able able to able to deserialize uh, out of band message which doesn't have the request attached field um, so it's not required so this is a change on the on the out of band receiver side so whereas previously uh, we expected that basically the request attached was required now it's covered by this default macro uh, so if the if the if the request attach field is not present um it'll just um get assigned uh, the default value which would be empty array um and yeah here we are testing that so this is actually technically breaking change for case where aries vcx is out of band uh producer and there's an older version of um older version of aries vcx receiver running against that um since the new version would stop producing stop serializing the request attached field the older version of the aries vcx agent would fail because for the older versions this field was required and it always had to be at least empty array but uh, i believe this doesn't actually uh, impact anyone uh, as, as i know uh, most most people are using aries vcx on the mobile side so this is uh, in that case this is just generally a fix because um, other uh, other implementations like akapai uh, they would simply not set the request attach um, or would not expect it um, to to be empty in a message so this kind of syncing up with a proper a correct implementation uh, at the same time it's uh, it's it's breaking in some very particular particular scenarios uh any question about this one guys uh, i guess we're good so I'll move to the next one um then uh, when we had the uh, libvcx split so this relates to the the deprecation we've been mentioning before so uh to kind of make it more clear and make it easier to communicate like the the overall state uh in this pr we have split uh, libvcx into two crates so it's a libvcx core and libvcx now basically libvcx the directory as it was named before it contains the same technically it, you know it builds into the same binary same crate uh, but it's just kind of smaller. Um, there's a deprecation notice here. Um, and basically, this is now built on top of a libvcx core, uh, which is a kind of a smaller smaller part of the original libvcx. Here we have also the diagram. So basically, this is what it looks like. We have a libvcx core. And on top of that, we have the libvcx, which uh, with the uh, iOS and Java wrappers, which we consider now deprecated. But also on libvcx core, we have built out the Node.js wrapper. And and uh, as I as I know, uh, Dinesh uh, from Canada is also building Flutter wrapper on top of libvcx core, similar to v6 Nappy RS. For my understanding, the unify uh, RESV6 will be where on this diagram? Uh, I'm sorry, I you kind of um, uh, there was some yeah. audio issue. Yeah, uh, for my understanding, the unify approach that we will have to replace the libv6 on this diagram will be where on the core. Right, so that would be again totally outside. That would be like um, you can imagine there would be a new box here on the right side, and that would 
point to the Aries VCX. So it, it, the UNIF file would be like a completely new wrapper around Aries VCX. Wouldn't have anything to do with the VCX core anymore. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, like gen generally speaking, we we are uh, uh, we are you know looking for contributors like. Um, uh, we don't have like a, a direct uh, um, mm, as as APSA, you know, as APSA, as APSA as a company, we don't have intention to develop the Unify wrapper itself. So we are looking for community engagement to help out with that. Uh, the people who want to use V6 long term, and you know, when I saying the V6 stuff is deprecated. It's just because we we you know we don't have uh, maintainers to take care of it. So uh, just want to state like one more time that you know it it doesn't have to be maybe necessarily deprecated. Somebody can kind of take uh, responsibility over maintaining it, but uh, we we don't have the the incentive and the, um, uh, the capacity in Absa to to support uh, this this component anymore. But we are supporting the other ones and and we strongly strongly encourage to you know for 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 the community members to um rather rather work on the uni ffi uh, than investing in the libvcx as we've been with this solution uh, for for quite a while and we are aware of the drawbacks associated and uh the, yeah the uni ffi looks like much easier to to develop and Probably wouldn't be yeah, terribly uh, a lot of effort to uh, build out something similar uh, in, on a uni FFI uh, as 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 the VCX. And we have already a kind of roadmap or strategy to to implement uh, all the the required protocol for uni FFI. No, there's not strategy. It's uh, really just like in encourage, you know, uh, like um, uh, I can't find the right word, but uh, experimentation. No, no, like something like encouragement, but different word. <laughs> well, like uh, endorsement, uh, yeah, like, yeah, you know, endorsement mm -hmm. to build build on the uni FI, uh, but. But um, it's a community project, so you know we, we, we endorse community to move over there. It, it, it should be it should be much better solution. But uh, it's it's not to like dictate what people have to do. But at the same time, you know, we encourage it, and but we don't have necessary resources to to build it out. You know, to build it out ourselves. As as APSA, we are mostly focused on the like internal Aries VCX. And then we have we have incentives to build the, the Node.js uh, at the moment. So this is important for us, but we are looking for the community to, to you know help us with uh, the other stuff which might be important for, important for them, which they can contribute. Uh, yeah, but uh, we I think we can we can we can definitely help and assist. But we are looking for for contributors uh, to to work on the Uni FFI. Uh, okay, I'll move to the next items now. Uh, so we had the AATH um, uh, like testing update by uh, by Mira. Uh, Mira is not on the call, so I just I'll just uh, briefly repeat what I remember. So, uh, as I know, Mira has uh, synced up the the like latest code base with the uh, latest version of the code base with the uh, uh, Aries agent test harness. Uh, so uh, there was some some older tests apparently failing, so we kind of fi fixed it up, uh, restored the. Kind of original coverage and functionality, and additionally, he also tried to uh, to uh, add support, add coverage for out of band scenarios, um, mostly with Akapa and FJ, and um, 
and we and he did succeed doing so for a few tests i believe but uh, many of the tests in the the test harness which relates to out of band protocol uh they are they are like the connection list connection less type of uh, message exchange um and that's something we are not supporting right now so um it's uh, described in this rfc 0496 uh basically it's kind of uh for those who are not aware of it uh th th there's a bit of a text for like transitioning from the old out of band uh kind of format um all the way here this is kind of the final result final conclusion of the rfc so i'll just briefly uh, take this opportunity to opportunity to to uh explain it uh, uh lightly so basically where without with typical out of band invitation message what you can do uh, let's see it here uh, you can you can attach uh, out of band, for example, you can attach request presentation into your out of band invitation. Now, this kind of proposes uh, this kind of proposes alternative, uh, first of all, format, but also functionality. So, basically, you would create a request presentation message, and you would kind of use and but you would include this special this additional service decorator. And generally, you would use this entire payload the same way you would use out of band message. So you'd probably render this as a QR code on a page, or you know, uh, you, uh, you embed it into a, a deep link button. Uh, but when the client receives this kind of message, uh, basically he wouldn't do any connection protocol. There is not really any way to do so. There's there is not declaration of what connection protocols are supported. Instead, the client would simply answer this request presentation message by sending the response to the service as stated here. And that's it. So, so the client doesn't have to do connection at all. So this can enable for faster uh, faster workflows, although uh, like I think uh, arguably a little bit less safe uh, when this kind of support for this kind of out of band messages like this is implemented on mobile devices. Basically, you don't have any anchoring to the ledger, so you cannot verify like the DID of the producer of this message, uh, and the uh, and the service is just something something someone put in here but you know can you really trust this can you really send your personal data to whoever produced this code and told you so to send it here so so it can be less safe it's important in this kind of cases it's important that the end user behind a mobile device understand the context of a, like a real world interaction so like scanning this kind of thing on an official uh, you know, website of organization is probably fairly trustworthy, fairly trustworthy as opposed to scanning it on the street where you don't really know who is asking it and there is not even a way to verify it for the for the mobile device. On the other hand, so it it can be uh, kind of less safe. It can lead to phishing attacks, uh, but um, uh, it can be faster. So I guess for those, for cases where the speed of the interaction is top priority and maybe security is not so important, um, then this kind of, I guess, this kind of uh, QR code can actually really enhance the use overall. And calls, and we don't currently implement this. Uh, I I see the warning. My connection is unstable. Can you hear me well, guys? Uh, you just dropped out for a second. Ah, okay. So, um, 
yeah we we don't currently implement this uh and we have like a bunch of work around the messages created right now as we will touch on soon so uh i think this is this can be really useful and um it's it's uh it's covered extensively in the in the aries agent test harness uh so in order for us to increase our coverage we should actually implement this uh, and I believe it shouldn't be too difficult either. It can lead to some generalization, I think, of our APIs. Um, so yeah, I think we can put this stuff on the, on our backlog, but uh, probably we don't have to address it right now as we are still with, busy with the messages and messages at rework. And uh, this is sort of overlapping as, as, it, as it's uh, related to messages as well. Any comments about uh, about Aristas harness or just this uh, RFC itself? Or questions? All right, I think we are good. So now we are getting to the work in progress. So uh, we have uh, messages uh, created uh, by Bogdan. Uh, I saw you, I saw that you posted a long kind of message with the update. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to like properly sit down and, and read through it. So maybe and and since we are in the meeting, maybe you can kind of take us through it and through your latest find, findings, Bogdan. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing so you can feel free to yeah, yeah. share what you need. Uh, on it. Mm. Is it this one? I guess it would be this. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So, uh, like I, I mentioned in the in the comments uh, on the PR, and I even I even answered to this uh, or just commented on this issue, um, which you documented so thoroughly, George, about uh, the the message IDs and threading and how it's done incorrectly right now. And it's basically like you mainly touched on the connection protocol implementation, but this actually spreads to quite everything else as well. Right. Um, and this is practically like I ever since I worked on the connection protocol refactor in the state machines, I kind of realized that things are a bit too intertwined. Um, and that makes them difficult to, to handle. So, and this is basically uh, just as another observation of why you basically just talked about the connection protocol here, because we treat threading as part of a protocol when it's in fact not really related to the protocol itself. Um, and like starting from that premise, um, it's basically just about the fact that, so I'm, I'm mainly, um, I don't know, just for um, illustration purposes, I'm talking about the threading decorator here mainly, but uh, it's actually uh, related to all, of, all other decorators um, and maybe just some other functionalities that we wanna, we wanna support. And it's very basically about um, separation of concerns and how we can achieve that in a consistent manner. And I really thought about this, like it's always been in the back of my head and I couldn't really you know, put my finger on a, on a solution. Um, but I think I came up with something that, and it's fairly simple, but uh, something that might help us uh, achieve what we wanna do. So um, like in, in, the threading, in the threading decorator, um, it's basically something that can be, used in virtually any message. Uh, in some messages, it's mandatory. In some messages, it's optional. Like you can have it or you can not have it. Um, and in some messages, we don't even think about it at all. Like we don't even need to consider. And I guess a good example of that would be like when you have a mediator and you're just routing messages, you might not care from the mediator, mediator standpoint um, about threading on the forwarded messages. You might care about threading on the inner message, but the mediator doesn't get access to that. So 
uh, it's not of any importance. Um, yeah, so maybe like like George uh, pointed out um, in the connection protocol, for instance, there is some uh, some things that have to happen in terms of threading. So you get a, a connection request, and um, that basically can can start the thread, and the response will have to respond to or use reuse the ID of the request as a as a for threading. Uh, but the request itself can come maybe. Um, from an out-of-band invitation or as a result of an out-of-band invitation. I think there was some discussions uh, at some point about um, the fact that that would also need some sort of thread. So regardless, the idea is that with these fields being so intertwined with the actual messages, like the, the protocol part of the messages, it's very hard to have some consistent or generic way to handle them. So my idea is to basically split the message um, in a way that would allow us to uh, easily or more easily distribute the necessary data to different parts of the code. So virtually any message can be represented by an ID. Uh, there is a type, but that's abstracted in our code because we only use that for conditional deserialization or serialization. Um, so it's not going to appear here, but it is present. So there's the type, there's an ID. Um, there is some content, and by content, I mean the actual fields defined in the protocol, like what is needed from um, the protocol standpoint and the protocol implement implementation to drive the state machine to its next state. Um, so I know in, a, in the request or response, um, for instance, you might need, uh, what do we have here? There was some connection, connection data stuff. Well, it's not here. I didn't add it. Anyway, but you might have some stuff that's literally part of the protocol. And then there's some external fields, um, which I, I call message decorators. So decorators that are in the scope of the entire message, like thread or timing. Um, there's that please acknowledge decorator. So there are quite a few. Um, and they're not really related to the content of the message as in the like the protocol uh, implementation or the state machine. They're basically used for other purposes. Um, maybe most of the time, sometimes maybe they, they are needed and that's fine and we can pass them around. Um, but most of the time they kind of have to be processed ex externally. And there's field decorators as well. Um, and the reason this is separated is, I don't know, you can think of the localization decorator um, where you can have a message scoped decorator and then you can have some field decorators for certain fields and the idea is that i honestly don't know i haven't implemented something like that and i i know i believe we don't have anything like that implemented in every pcx but conceptually to be able to process everything consistently you kind of need the field decorators to be processed along that message scoped decorator so the whole idea is just to be able to pass these things around without having to decompose the actual contents of the message. Um, so this is a very basic comparison of what this would look like for the request, the connection request. So this is pretty much what it looks like right now um, in the current implementation. Um, again, the, the, the type is abstracted away, but the ID is here. Uh, we have some like actual content and then we have these decorators um, and they're all part of the same data structure. So taking this apart can be quite tricky and especially taking this apart for all, um, you know, all messages again can become quite tricky. And this is what the message, like the generic message here would look like after monomorphization for the request um, for the connection request. So again, you get the ID, type is abstracted away. You have this request content, which now only contains this stuff, um, which is basically what we need for the protocol itself. And then we have some message decorators, uh, which would be these, and we can destructure these further and do whatever we want with them. We can take the thread, if there is one, do something with it. We can take the timing decorator, do something with it while serially or in parallel, we can do something with the request content itself. Like if you consider something that would need an expiration, 
um, and we would use the timing decorator for that. You can basically just have two futures um, spawned and just do a, a select on them to get the one that finishes first. So either the the entire process expires or you get to process the uh, message content as intended. So that's pretty much about it. The field decorators, there's not really any meaningful ones here. And this is a type that I introduced. I mean, this is probably not going to stay with that name, but uh, I jokingly called it that. So this is basically just a type that's going to serialize and deserialize to nothing. So basically just get ignored completely um, without having to uh, make anything fail or make changes like that. Now, um, the idea of the field decorators, I mean, I don't necessarily like conceptually what the implementations do with the with those. I find them pretty bad, but uh, that's just a personal opinion. Now, there's no, uh, like I wouldn't call it a strong rule about defining all the field decorators here uh, because like even in that um, attachment, like in the out of band message, you have those, you have that attachment, which is really part of the actual content. Like, yeah, it's a decorator on a field, but the you cannot process the content without it. So that would, in my view, go in the content itself. Um, maybe stuff like, as I said, like a, a field localization, or I don't know if there's any other good examples, maybe those would go in here. So you can take them apart without touching the content that's required to drive the state machine. And the structuring and recomposing this stuff would be easy. Now the benefits would be, again, like you can take the thread out um, and create a reply to the thread or create a subthread from it. And you get a new, th a new thread object, a new thread struct, and that you pass along and generate, build up your message and it's gonna be built correctly. Uh, without having to do manual um, digging through the message itself or anything like that. Um, so it would become more consistent in terms of how we process this. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, here I pretty, pretty much mentioned that I don't <laughs> really like the field decorators um, and how I uh, would probably um, do them differently, but in any case, I guess I also mentioned the fact that I guess a good candidate for having something in the field decorators is uh, like a field decorator for localization, possibly along a message decorator, and you would most likely need to process those together, so you need to be able to extract them in uh, in some way. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, that's pretty much what it entails. And I think this would allow us a lot of other stuff, even this uh, out of band messaging, like connectionless messaging. Um, we should be able to have things in a more, um, I don't know, easy to follow and easier to decompose structure and, and data structures. And that would mean we can be more um, generic about how we approach things and be more consistent about how we approach things, even across protocols. Because that's pretty much the point, to have the uh, protocol agnostic stuff separate from the actual protocol specific stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, another point that maybe we can touch, touch on briefly um, would be about, can you, can you see my ID? I'm not sure if I shared just Chrome or... No, just your browser. Okay. Uh, let me share this again. Here we go. Can you see it now? Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, so one idea that um, occurred to me is how we would handle these message decorators internally or in, in the messages that we define and the protocols that we specify in the messages crate or the messages for the protocols that we handle. Um, and how most of the time these decorators, so we have a fairly 
uh, static list of decorators that we support. Um, and I was thinking of a way to kind of approach this uh, in a generic fashion, which can definitely be done. And it would kind of boil down to something like this. And what this is, is mainly just a structure that would take a generic for all the, each decorator that we, we take. And by default, they would again be like this uh, completely ignored data type. Uh, so they, it's a zero size type, it would get erased at compile time. Because the alternative would be in the message decorators to basically generate one like for requests, one for a response, and so on and so forth, uh, which can get a bit verbose. It's not, I, it, I don't know, not necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily be problematic. And in fact, I, it might have its, the advantage of being uh, clearer because this, it will have quite a, a few generics. And if you consider that maybe new decorators would get added in the future, then this list would increase. And even if we use some just aliases or stuff like that from a user, point of view, and just to showcase this, uh, basically wrote this here, the aliases, the aliases are not really taken into consideration when uh, you're using your ID or something like that. So uh, like if you have this, we have the structure, it takes two generics, and we, we destructure it, you pretty much get the actual types. So in the message case, you destructure this, and this would be, this would have to be destructured as well, and it would look like this with some actual types implemented here. And then you have to choose which ones to, like, to actually store and which ones to ignore, if any of them are maybe the, the dummy type. Um, it would technically result in a little less code, uh, at least compiled code, even less code to like from, from a uh, maintainability point of view, because it's this, just this one type. Um, and due to monomorphization, it would result in like common decorator pattern implementations would boil down to the same type. I don't know if it's really worth it in terms of readability though, um, because then you have to keep track of what you passed here, like what actual decorators are defined to some type and, and so on and so forth. So. I'm not sure if this is an abstraction, we might want to do it. I explored the idea, but um, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, impressed by what we can achieve with it. So maybe in terms of readability, it might be worth just having um, to def like just defining types for each uh, message we use and pass the decorators we need there pretty much just like this and just use this type. And this can be easily tracked to the actual type implementation. You see you have this, there's no uh, black magic happening under the hood. So you, you just destructure it to these two things and that's it. And if you add something new, um, the compiler will, uh, uh, will yell at you that you need to handle the destructuring completely. Whereas here you would probably just ignore some, some stuff. So again, might not be, ideal i think yeah, i i now now that i see this <clears throat> i guess to to solution compared i i also agree that uh probably better better way is to go with a bit more uh like uh code duplication yeah, the, rather than like yeah uh, it makes it easier for yeah. like maybe new newcomers to also read the code when uh, you know there's uh sometimes the, the generics can be scary and there's too much of it, it it will make it easier for us as well i honestly am sure that i even if i write this two months from now i'm still going to get confused about how like what exactly this means and 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 stuff like that so it's just it would just be uh too little of a benefit for um too abstract of a of a concept um but yeah that's that's pretty much it not, not to mention that um you would have to sort of handle the serialization in in some way and you would need some sort of trait that you implement to basically be able to skip the serialization if needed and you would have to implement that for uh decorators and if they're optional do it for that as well mm, might, might not be 
uh, the best thing ever. Maybe even from a compiled time. I, I even forgot about the trait. It might even boil down to uh, more or less the same amount of code. So yeah, I, I would just go with the old fashioned way of just defining a structure for uh, each individual message, putting the decorators there, everything is clear as day and that's it. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much the, the idea. Now, on the other hand, I don't know, is it worth like, I'm, I'm not also too convinced about this uh, as in passing this generic here as well. Is it worth um, having this separate since we just want to destructure this anyway? Maybe we could just put the decorators together um, and just handle them like that. It would also be uh, an idea. Yeah, the, um, the thing is, I guess we, we are not really using the, in, in practice, we are not really using the field decorators you know, in any sort of APIs, or we don't have the the multi-language support stuff uh, currently, which is kind of, well, the field decorators are, that's one of the main use cases I understand uh, for the field decorators. So maybe, uh, maybe well, it's better to go with, with like simpler solution. So we wouldn't, may, I don't know, like prematurely try to, I don't know, generalize too much without understanding standing and seeing how like what would be the ideal api for them and the, like the, the layout and the structure i don't know so i mean ultimately technically we use field decorators uh and, and this is exactly again why i think they're just badly designed like even the, the attachments and stuff like that the services like there's all that stuff that is practically a decorator, but the I guess just the definition of what a field decorator is is uh, not not particularly great. In any well, case, like um, the field decorator is like you have a some field full bar and then you have full bar tilde something, right? So we have like kind of two mm, versions of the same that. thing. Not even that. You you can literally just have the decorated field without the field and that is present across the code base and across the rfcs like there are um and um, i don't know there are multiple instances even for requests or stuff like that requests and then uh you know the um attach decorator so what that attachment decorator without an actual request field so again it's really a i don't know uh, weird thing um but the point is that ultimately it all boils down to things that we want to have inside the message content as in the protocol specific content or the state machine specific content because technically the protocols uh, specify the decorators too but the state machine specific content and the non-state machine specific content and I believe we can technically just merge those two together in a decorators field and just put whatever we need there. Like even if you have, um, because they don't overlap, right? So even if you have um, something like uh, the message scope localization decorator, and then you have a field decorator on some field, uh, like I, I mentioned in the, um, in the comment here, you can have both of those together in that same data, data structure, and then you can deserialize them, I guess. Um, maybe one I one concept would be, I, I don't remember specifically, and I will have to look it up. I'm not sure if the field decorators can be found within like nested uh, fields, as in, mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't remember. I think I've seen something about localization decorator. I don't remember for sure. Um, but nevertheless, hmm. message type thread what. Hmm. I don't remember necessarily, but you 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 see my point, right? You know, 
do you understand what I mean? Because then things get a bit trickier. Um, I mean, right. I think let's you, let's take this maybe to the like discussion on a on a on a GitHub. So we, we have fifty right. minutes left. So we can cover the rest yeah, of the. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the progress. Um, we'll think about it some more. Feel free to comment on the PR. Uh, you know, review it and so on, and we can further discuss this. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Thank you. It was it was very very useful and pretty pretty thorough presentation. Uh, so okay, and now as for the next point, uh, the upcoming work. So, um, I saw the, I saw you, George. You had a PR about the f feature flagging VDR tools. I, I saw its draft. So I guess just the question, like uh, it's pretty clear what it does. Uh, uh, the question is like how, how much effort is there left you know uh what is, are you facing some challenges and um i guess this was more just to start a conversation about whether it's something that aries vcx wants to have um i think i think we might have talked about this concept before um did, did you understand what i was trying to get across with this so far yeah yeah to basically uh select you either use the vdr tools or in in the uh for the like ledger interactions right so you don't bring two dependencies simultaneously yeah yeah exactly and like um i think originally i was thinking that these server these feature flags would uh allow us to sort of bypass some of the dependency conflicts between Aries Ascar and VDR tools. Um, but that's not the case because, um, you know, when you're working on the Aries VCX uh, workspace, your cargo lock still tries to combine both of them and, and freaks out. Um, but um, at, at least with this feature flag, um, consumers can sort of pick uh, whether they want the VDR tools implementation of a profile uh, or whether they want, you know, the uh, modular dependencies, for lack of a better term, version of the profile. Um, and then, you know, they don't have to drag in the entire set of dependencies for both. Mm. Um, yeah, so this initial uh, PR was just putting that flag around, um, putting the flag around the VDR tools profile. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, there shouldn't, really be too many other changes required um right yeah but there's a couple uh, but the, is there is there like if you use this is it really possible to get like rid of the vdr tools dependency because there's also oh well if you're using ascar yeah then you pretty much have everything right 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 because uh, i was about to say like oh but you still need the wallet but that's the point with Ascar if you are trying to stop using the libidr tools wallet yeah so we definitely still need to fix the aries Ascar dependency conflicts in the future um but putting this feature flag in right now would let consumers basically import uh aries vcx into their project without the libvdr tools dependencies and then you mm -hmm. know they can put in whatever profile they want. It could be an in-memory one, or it could be based off Aries Ascar, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So no, I'll, it's it's a draft. So I'll I'll have a look, but uh, I'll be I'll be waiting for the final 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 version when it's ready for review, and we can oh. make a review. Yeah, the only thing that's keeping it in a draft at the moment is there is, um, so I guess the refactor I did a while ago was to separate out that that indie uh, sub-module from being used basically anywhere except for uh, the, the pro indie profile uh, implementation. But mm -hmm. there is still a couple references to that indie sub-module throughout the code uh, and mm -hmm. the main reason for that is we use libindy mocks in a few places uh -huh. um but right. i think that could be replaced because it's not really libindy specific um it could be just a generic mocks structure or mocking mm -hmm. could be rethought entirely 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll I'll have a look and um, I'll I'll try to see, try to better understand each challenge so I can have some useful input on it as well. Cool, cool. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's let's go further. Um, All right, next up, uh, this is like a task I'm currently working on actually, and it's about uh, basically get, no, not actually not me. It's um, it's Mira who's working on this or will be working on this soon. It's getting rid of the, the legacy kind of methods for dealing, for writing service on the ledger, uh, reading it from the ledger. So basically this write endpoint legacy and parse legacy endpoint attrib uh, this is some historical, basically any any new users by default are using the the proper did solve uh, method implementation where um, they're reading endpoint attribute from the ledger and a very key associated for that particular DID on the ledger as if you see pinkies. Uh, yeah, just getting rid of the old code. So this this should be probably done throughout like next couple of days and yeah that brings us to the end uh so i wanted to know that uh suggest that we do a release uh 053 as there was this out of band serialization deserialization fix which is also technically uh, a breaking change in a particular scenario, although I don't think it uh, impacts uh, like any any of our users. Uh, still, still, uh, it's it's good to have uh, uh, rather more frequent than less frequent releases and make it like more consumable. Um, smaller smaller steps. And uh, previously we had a release after one month, so we should kind of. Uh, enhance our, our release morale and try to do it more often at least at least at least once once in two weeks or so uh next up i saw um a post from uh stephen curran on a this mentorship projects um which we can like the hyperledger um, Hyperledger um, projects can kind of like apply for or join. Uh, it would uh, entail like some mentoring, some people who want to contribute, kind of like, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's called, it, it's the right word is intern or it just like a mentee, uh, but that's the idea. So I think it would be cool uh, if we join it. Uh, and we have some, some, uh, somebody, somebody wants to maybe learn Rust. Doesn't have to be like experienced developer, but I think there's plenty of work uh, people could work on. And uh, even there's like a, like a bunch of ideas uh, for the projects which could be built on top of Ares VCX, which will be also i think uh, good good candidates like the the the, the in this menti uh, does wouldn't necessarily have to work directly in the aries v6 code base but could be working on top of it and there's a few i like pr project ideas here written on our wiki page in a, in a, on the root page uh yeah it's listed here like verifier agent or uh, credential faucet or to implement the mediator uh li literally the mediator agent uh, implementing the pickup protocols uh, using Ares v6 or just as we recently had there was like idea for the implement uh mediator client who supports pickup protocol or even more relevant maybe uh, like these days maybe the one of the most useful like places to help out would be the uni f5 wrapper uh, if we can find a person who who wants to kind of like uh, uh, improve it work, work on it that, that would be pretty awesome and i think it would be worth 
spending spending time uh like hoping uh, onboarding someone on the project if if we can get some uh helping hand in in return uh okay uh next item as a Oh yeah, the protocol threading behavior that pretty much gonna bring us to the end of the meeting probably. Uh, and it's the issue uh, you created, George. Uh, yeah, and very, very thoroughly described about the, like some issues we have uh, in the current implementation with, with threading. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure like what the strategy to take. You, you mentioned uh, like, um, I'll, I I agree. Like yeah, this there's stuff uh, like which should be probably changed and like given a uh, extra thoughts and uh like I cannot I I'm not able to address uh personally in, individually each of these suggested points right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a more thinking about how to approach it in terms of like currently we are. Uh, George, uh, Bogdan is working on the uh, messages crate. So uh, I don't know, should we kind of wait for that to settle, I guess? We should. In the end? Yes. Uh, so the, the, the whole idea would be that having the thread and even the idea outside of the you know, state machine related stuff would allow us to um, reply like create a reply thread or a sub thread or just a new thread from an implicit thread or any stuff like that outside of the state machine or the state machine handling code and basically those uh, there would be some methods on the on the thread uh, object the thread struct and stuff like that and that would provide a consistent manner of creating these threads then when we go back to the state machines we simply have to call some methods and we get the the correct thread that would be the the idea behind it you can invest the time in changing and we're, we're fixing this uh in its current state but it's probably gonna like it most definitely will be um you know, uh, factored out when with the new messages crate. So mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to point out because we have to apply this sort of mentality to all the, and, and the same approach to all the protocols. Yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds right. Yep. Okay, well, I just gotta say that it's like super useful how like you listed out all the issues. Uh, it's something we can now that we, I, I, it, it like really perfectly aligns with the stuff going on with the, uh, like Bogdan's uh, rework. Is this is something we can now use w when when we'll be like synchronizing the integrating the new implementation with the state machines? I guess. We can, this is this is something we can like uh, uh, yeah anchor like use to to make sure that uh, everything's right and we don't have to make any additional like fixes afterwards. So yeah, then just then thank you so much for uh, investing time into into you know looking into this. Yeah, yeah, all good. Um, Bogdan Dinov. Point three in here would be addressed by the messages crate. Uh, it's about how we like create the response message early before sending it out. Not by the messages crate itself, because it yeah. doesn't handle the protocol state machines. But after the messages crate is done, I will revisit the connection protocol as well, and then move on to the other state machines. And yes, we will we will change this. So. Uh, okay. I believe that we, we also had a short exchange on Discord about this. I'm I'm on the same page as you are. I think it should be, uh, you know, set uh, set differently. Okay, fantastic. Cool. Yep. Should I close this issue or? No, I think we can keep it open. I think uh, until until the issues are like basically the stuff you listed here is is addressed one way or the other i think we can 
keep it open. I think it's okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, all right. I think I had something to say. Oh, just a very like a small note. Um, I, I just, a technical small note. I believe uh, that this test ID you mentioned here, like if you try to, maybe you try to check how the behavior in the tests and you saw this test ID, but I believe this is only being applied when you are like literally, literally running the tests, but the behavior, current implementation cannot distinguish two implementations for the default message ID. So when you are running in a test, it would generate this te test ID for IDs. But when you're actually running like, you know, normal code, it generates UID. Right. Okay. Yeah, I haven't actually tried it uh, in reality. I was just looking at the default method. Yeah, for... yeah. It's this kind of ugliness and I don't like it. But it will be again uh, addressed with uh, Bogdan's uh, Bogdan's changes. Uh, that uh, there, there's essentially like two implementations for the right the kind of me message has like two impulse, and one is for the test. You know, when you're running in the test, the other one is when you're compiling just the proper code. So then, uh, and and I don't like it because then you are literally testing different code than what is actually running in production. Since the testing code generates this, but the real code generates something else. And obviously it's also confusing since since this this is how easy for you it was to get confused. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but uh, it will be addressed. So we'll get rid of that as well. Okay, great, great. All right, uh, uh, Rafael to leave. Uh, Thank you, Rafael, for joining us. I see that he disconnected already. Nevertheless, well, I think we are also at the end of the meeting. Um, it's pretty much it. I Anyone? Have, uh, I have one yeah, question yeah. if you have time. For sure. Um, uh, I was looking at some of the issues uh, in the issue list, uh, and one of them was about upgrading uh, SQLX, I believe. It yeah. Was 3 3. Uh, I was wondering if you'd looked at that. Uh, I did look at that like kind of briefly. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I know that it, uh, I, I looked at it to the degree that I figured that it should actually uh, like solve, it should probably solve the issues with the, uh, I'm not sure if I'm not 100% sure if all of them but it should solve at least some of the, de the dependency conflicts with the Aries Ascar wallet yeah yeah so, it almost fixes them all um the, there there's still some remaining issues in Ursa and some of the locked in dependencies there but Ursa's mm -hmm. had some activity recently uh I think that fixes it but they haven't merged that in yet so hopefully uh -huh. they do that and it'll be good Right, yeah, but uh, I and 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 one additional note I have here is that uh, we've looked into it in the past, not myself, uh, but uh, there was some issue with Android, I believe. So it was like this uh, sort of um, sort of libvcx issue it was causing on Android, but perhaps what we could do. Um, we could maybe well first we can simply try to upgrade it but now that like libby says is kind of deprecated we could for it maybe we could try uh, i'm not sure if it's possible but i suppose we could try to like have one version of sql x uh, but it's all the way in the vdr tools i was thinking that the 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 like libvcx build would use different version of sql x than the default build based on some feature flags or something like that but given given that the sql x is like uh, three layers deep under libvcx that might be maybe it's doable but might be a bit awkward i'm not sure uh, so um are you saying that sql x uh the most recent version of it 
has issues with Android. Is that is that right? Uh, now use case of it. There was something about Android, but honestly, I mm. don't really remember what was the issue. But I think you know it might not be necessarily just Android itself. Maybe it was simply the libvcx Android build. Mm. Uh, not necessarily, you know, if you use uh, uh, RSD6 from you know, like UniFi and you upgrade SQL X, I don't mean to say that you are run into issues. Maybe I think maybe it was just with the like libvcx kind of. Uh, Android build. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, it it uh, I I didn't uh, I didn't try to upgrade it and get it running. So I I don't have like the the technical results. But uh, we tried it a long time ago. There was some complications. We didn't see it at the time as a uh, as a high priority. That was before all of this like uh, Ariza scar. And we just dropped it then, so we didn't proceed it further. Proceed further. Did the did the issue come up when you were running tests for Android devices? Um, like if I were mm -hmm. to if I were to make a, a PR that just upgrades SQLX, will I notice the problem in the testing if if Android's failing? testing uh like with uh with your infrastructure like with your code or i you mean just in uh, the ci of uh, yeah, yeah let the ci run the android tests uh yeah i I, I, I suppose i suppose it should i'm not i'm, pretty, I'm not 100 percent sure it, okay, it was cool. quite a long long time ago okay cool 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 Okay, guys, so um, if there's nothing else, anything else? No, from my side. Oh, good. Okay, guys, so thank you for, thank you for joining, and uh, let's talk again next week. Great. See thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.